But it takes something to move on from a job that you've been in for over three decades. That's exactly what Shami Heffernan did this week as he bade farewell to being part of the Ballydoyle firmament full-time. Aidan O'Brien said he might still come in for the, the old ride. But it does mark the end of an era, David Yates, doesn't it? And he's off now to ride for other people, including Paddy Toomey, who said he'd be using him. <coughs> Absolutely. And, and that's a, an interesting tie-up, isn't it? A, a blend of experience and relative youth, which is, is uh, I'm sure, will... We'll, uh, go well. It's a very interesting story. This it's not a particularly surprising one. I think a few weeks ago, um, Shami Heffernan wasn't part of uh, a, uh, a a set of jockeys who rode Ballydoyle work at Dundalk. That was the um, August road out work. Wasn't that's it? right. Yeah. And um, since then, there's the, tongues have been wagging that perhaps uh, a, a departure. Uh, was on the way, and so it proves. I, I, I'd be very interested to see how this works out. I always thought that it, it, it can't be easy being the number two jockey driver, can it? To to uh, uh, at a big stable, you know that there are going to be big, the biggest races that fall your way, like the the Derby, the Irish Derby, numerous classics. But equally, you are in the shadow of of the guy who's having the choice. Um, I wondered, we mused earlier in the week, whether it was the equivalent of, of uh, you know, working your career in the city and then, and then retiring to become a, a landscape artist or something like that. But it's clear that Shamie Heffernan's commitment to the city his riding job is, is still 100%, but it's just in a different sphere. And the thing is, Skew, if you are beyond 50 and you still want to ride, even though you're leaving a job like that, it says something about your mental and physical well-being, doesn't it? Yeah, so I admire that side of it. But you know, from our point of view, isn't it? I don't know. We have... You must have apprentices and stable jockeys and stuff. We have four or five jockeys. It's very... It's, it's the nearest we get to being a football manager, I suppose, is, is keeping the substitute happy, you know. So um, I can see that he would have seen himself as a substitute and he probably has great belief in himself and you get off your bottom and try and get... move on and prove everybody wrong and we will see. Um, with, uh, Jonathan Lower was your, your sub at Martin Pipes for a long time, wasn't he? Yes, it, it, that was... And that was good because you, I needed to... Like, I was thinking he was a sort of good team player, wasn't he? Because he was around the yard a lot and a, he was very much part of the outfit, wasn't he? Yeah, and I, I, those, I, I still tend to run my stable a little bit like that. You need, you need these people and um, sometimes... You you know, sometimes I heads. got off horses mm -hmm. occasionally. I didn't like it for, for Jonathan to ride. And then I got the wrong ones as well and Jonathan rides festival winners. So it, 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 you know, it works both ways, but... Um, yeah, no, they are they're substitutes. It's difficult, and you know, as I say, you believe in yourself as a jockey, so um, you don't want to get. You you think he probably think you know quite rightly probably thinks he bays, rides better than Ryan. I mean, you've, you've got to have that belief. Um, ben Cohen was one of the most able uh, substitutes. The wrong word, but um, jockey bookings inspired jockey bookings this week because there was a, a meeting at Wolverhampton, wasn't it? David, that's right. Yeah, restricted Tuesday. riders meeting. So yeah, you, you couldn't have ridden more than thirty winners in a calendar year. Ben Cohen's ridden fifty-six. Yeah, he was still allowed to ride there. Um, BHA insisted that they could see it coming, but they were just going to wait for it to come until they closed the loophole. Yeah, um, that's that's uh, uh, that's right. There, there are two aspects to this story, aren't there? The one is the loophole, as you say. I mean, uh, anyone who caught on to this, you were supposed to ride 30 or fewer winners march to march in Britain. Uh, ben Cohen, as we know, has, has well exceeded uh, that total. In, in Ireland, in, yeah. In Ireland, including, uh, including a, a victory at the, the highest level in the um, Irish St Ledger. And he pretty much cleaned up, didn't he? Had two winners and uh, his other four rides, I think, all made the frame. So, yes, there was that aspect of the loophole, which the BHA saw coming and then uh, closed it after Ben Cohen had gone through it. Um, the other uh, issue is that he said he's looking to ride more in Britain in 2024, oh. which I thought was quite interesting. And, and obviously, as, as a Frenchman who trains in Britain, who, is, who has moved country to change here, and Skew is someone I'm sure that even before you hit the heights of your jockey's career, you perhaps looked at other lands and thought, I wonder if the grass is greener over there, you know? 
Um, so I, I look back now and think perhaps I should have gone to France or <laughs> somewhere. Um, yeah, um, look, you want every opportunity. I mean, I suppose, you know, the great people, you know, my idols when I was a kid was Lester Bigot and he was riding in Ireland and, and France and um, I never got to quite that level. I rode in Norway or Germany or somewhere <laughs> and occasionally France, but uh, I used to think I was Lester under the saddle and hope everybody recognised me <laughs> as I went onto the plane, but it, it didn't work out quite like that. But uh, no, I think it's a young man, you want to um, experience a different races and test yourself against the best. I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about that later on. We certainly will um, when Lucinda joins us as well. Stable staff fees. Let's just take a look at the, the way this made, made the headline. Stable staff chief, uh, this is uh, George McGrath, the chief executive of National Association of Racing Staff, said working fee is non-negotiable if Sunday evening racing is continued beyond the pilot, the pilot of uh, six uh, Sunday evening meetings. W are we assuming that these are going to carry on, David, the Sunday evening fixtures? I hope not. Have you had any comeback from the NTF? Um, no, not really. But um, personally, I'm I'm against it because uh, ra racing on Sunday afternoon I don't mind, but Sunday evening is just a little step too far, really. Um, just elaborate on that a little bit. But we have to be at work on on Monday morning and go racing on Monday afternoon, Monday evening. So there's no stop, you know. I think. Um, Everybody should be allowed a bit of family time, a bit of quiet time, and going racing on Sunday evening is the last thing uh, I want to do, really. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people are in the same situation. What about your staff? Yeah, I think they're pretty much the same. OK, and so how has this come to a head as regards the fee structure? Well, I mean, you know, the, George McGrath's quite rightly said, if this pilot is to continue, then the £150 fee for working that Sunday evening has to continue as well. I mean, you know, I, I think that even the, the most uh, ardent union basher would surely see that, that that is a very reasonable argument, that, that it's a pilot, you got the fee during the pilot, and if it carries on, uh, the fee must continue. George McGrath said, even with that fee, um, that his members are not keen on Sunday evening racing, the PJA survey has yet to come back, but certainly uh, anecdotal uh, evidence and responses from the weighing room are that they're not mad about it either. Uh, one other thing, apart from the um, the the burnout for the for the participants, is I just wonder whether it's good to have a little break and whether you know that. One more football thing: when you go through uh, Christmas mm. and. You know, there's a game on every night. A lot of even, you know, I'm not a, a, an ardent football fan, but I enjoy football. After a couple, you think, you know what, I'm, I'm going to, I'm not going to watch this tonight. I've watched football the last couple of nights. And that, a sweet shot the, the burnout yeah, for the viewer, I think, is, is there. Sometimes they need a break. Uh, I just want you to keep going here for a minute. Something you never thought I'd, you'd hear me say. <laughs> but why is bookmaker conduct? come under increased scrutiny, particularly uh, on social media, where yeah. it's been oxygenated. And, and, and it's whoever put this running order together with the uh, talking points has done a really Genius. good job. Well, do you know what our producer the, today was burning the midnight oil, and not only that, he was in here at five o'clock this morning the, putting the running order together. The, the, the BHA is looking for a turnover increase of 15 to 20 per cent on the Sunday evening fixtures in order to continue. Now, the interesting thing with regard to bookmaker conduct is their seat at the table. Like, we, we often when we're... We've, right in the middle of the levy negotiations, right. they've put a deal on the table. And, and, and when we're talking about the restructuring of British racing, premierisation, et cetera, et cetera... Sunday night meetings. And, Sunday night meetings. An awful lot of that data has come from betting companies, right? Now, we understand that. We've, they've got very sharp brains. They've got a very good eye on the bottom line. And th they are in a good position to tell us what will work and what will not. Even though, what will not, even though they're motivated, obviously, like all of us, by self-interest. But to get a seat at the table, should they not have to sign up to a very minimum, at least, level of 
uh, conduct so, and accountability. So to be more specific, because. there were some specific examples that were being cited on social media. Now, it's very difficult when you see screen grabs to verify those. Of course it is. So until they're verified, you wouldn't want to start saying, well, it's this bookmaker yeah. or that bookmaker. But generally speaking, nearly all the major firms, you will hear anecdotal stories and of something like this. And there was one example of not being paid out sixth place in a race that had been advertised as sixth that's place each way terms because there hadn't been the requisite number of finishers. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's just like, insanity. Mo moving the goalposts after the match has taken place, yeah. place. Now, it's frustrating enough for a punter when you, when you try and place a bet on the Cheltenham Festival or the Grand National, not the, the seller at Great Yarmouth where someone thinks, mm, you know, there's a... There's a Really disproportionate amount of um, uh, of support for the second favourite here, but big races, mm. and it's frustrating enough when you, you you click place bet and it comes back with like, well, you can you can have four pounds thirty three yeah. each way, and you think, for goodness sake, what sort of industry what, what sort of industry are we dealing with? But that is another thing entirely to moving the goalposts and. Uh, and seizing funds in so many cases. Now, as you say, these are screen grabs on social media, but a lot of them are coming... A, they're coming in big numbers, and many of them are coming from people that you and I know yeah. and sources that, and there that is, we would there trust. Is, there is barely a firm that is immune Absolutely. This well. Now, obviously, it's the Gambling Commission who issue licences and regu regulate uh, this industry, but... If bookmakers can't have it both ways, and when we listen to the debate in Westminster, they came in for quite a lot of stick, particularly from Philip Davies. Um, but they can't have it both ways. If they want a seat at the table and tell us what is good for the sport in the future and how how it should be shaped and reshaped, then at the very least they have to show by their behaviour that they are worthy of of that place because at the moment if a small fraction of those uh, issues that are raised on social media never thought you'd say something good about social media but it had to happen one day then then right. they are not worthy of that seat at the table uh, until they get their own house in order and what price do you think any of them would lay me about Ballyburn winning a champion hurdle and a gold cup quite this... a bit but only to one pound 37 <laughs> I was just thinking of that because I could see Ballyburn fading in the background, coming out there. Um, so this is fascinating. I really enjoy this. Uh, the last horse to do it was Dawn trained Run. by Willie's father. I got beaten by Dawn Run and Neck in the champion hurdle. And Dawn Run lent across me all the way across. The first year she got a five, five pound allowance and I got beaten Neck. I would have beaten her if... Um, no, I don't know. She, would, she never gave up. She got beaten this Did race... You, remind me who you were riding in that race. I was riding a Seema for Jim Old Morning Jim. He'll be watching this somewhere, I suspect. Thank God, he, thank God <laughs> Jim, you won a champion <laughs> with Holly Bay 12 <laughs> years later. Otherwise, yeah, this, yeah. this would all have been... Yeah, Jim and I always feel if um, the stands may have burnt down at uh, Cheltenham if the... the uh, it had been reversed, the uh, thing. Well, that was our feeling. Um, it's, a good but, job. it's a good job you don't really think about it anymore. Dawn Run got <laughs> beat, I think. This is, uh, and, and Mr Ron Barry may be watching this. I think Dawn Run got beat in the race that Ballyburn uh, won. The I then what, Sun Alliance hurdle. The then Sun Alliance. I didn't know mm -hmm. if I was allowed to say Sun Alliance. Um, and Sabin de Loire won, I believe. I think West Tip ran in the same race as well. So it must, what, a, what a fantastic... But you uh, weren't riding Sabin de Loire, were you? No, no, he was with a chap called Dickinson. That's who right, completely yeah. dominated the sport at the time. And Funny it was that. completely wrong. And, we, <laughs> <laughs> and was it a disgrace that he dominated the sport? A disgrace. Nobody could get a look at it. He made it uncompetitive. Uh, and, and he never gave me a ride, no. <laughs> <laughs> Where were we? <laughs> I'm enjoying this. But yes, but so Ballyburn. Yes, it'd the be fantastic. That you could, you, the idea the very idea that someone's even thinking you could do both now. Now, we had a little bit of it with Constitution Hill, didn't we? And then that yeah. got parked. Yeah, so I think this is fantastic. Um, we will touch on these subjects later, I'm sure. But, uh, you know, we go on about people, the stars, the sport, or the horse. And if Ballyburn's doing that, it's fantastic. I thought he was perhaps the star, nearly the star of the show at, at Cheltenham. It's a horse that I, um, I know Mr Ronnie Bartlett well. I, I, I saw the quote from... Um, Patrick Mullins earlier in the season that he thought he was his best horse. So I, I'd, I'd followed him, though he got beat first time out. Um, he's obviously 
come good and he looks he, he looks as if he could do it. He look, as I say, I thought, you know, we saw many, many great horses at Cheltenham and I thought Ballyburn is, is one to follow as much as anything and, and uh, he will make, you know, he's the future. He could be the future of national racing. Yeah, the fact that somebody's even entertaining the possibility of the two races, I think, is just fascinating for the, for the sport, as, as Skew was saying. Horse Racing Betters Forum, chaired by Sean Trivas, has issued a, a, a formal complaint or have um, articulated their, their thoughts as have brought them together as regards the accuracy of going reports. Um, and not only have they called for going reports to be more accurate, they've called for retrospective changes to going reports if they are subsequently proved to be wrong. Um, can I ask you, gentlemen, first of all, and perhaps this applies even more acutely on the flat than it does jumping, uh, David, even though the Cheltenham Festival prompted it, are you somebody who gets het up about going reports during the course of the season, as things stand at the moment? Not very often. There's a few tracks that you, you know you can't trust. So you just look at the weather forecast and make your own mind mm. <laughs> on what might happen. <laughs> but um, on the whole, look... And is that um, because of the people or is it just because the tracks play unpredictably? That's a good question. <laughs> I think it's probably a bit of both. Can I, can I be controversial? Do you sure. feel hope so. That, That's why we've hired you. Do you feel <laughs> that sometimes the younger clerk of the courses can get bullied, whereas the tradition, the older ones, the, the been there for a long time? I don't know. I'm not sure it's controversial, but um, no. Nah, look, we we won't name and shame. No, I wasn't. No, I wasn't. I just think some. <laughs> can well, run, get run with it, Skew. No, I think some can get bullied in in, in some. Bullied of the by. Jockeys, trainers. No, by the executives behind them. Ah, okay. Yeah. Uh, well, so don't don't call it heavy because well, don't I mean, call it good to I, firm. Yeah, I think it's the firm ground jumping. I, 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 I think I, I think it's the extreme. You know, yeah. if if the ground is uh, good to firm, but on the verge of firm, they they're going to keep it good to firm. Yeah. I, and the, sometimes and the yeah. British they don't like to run on heavy, so no. it's kind of yeah. the same. I mean, I think I've, I've been to the races, and as a young man there, anything. He's got. He's called this completely mm. wrong, you know. And, uh, and and we make. We all yeah. learn. I'm not. That is. I'm not and knocking them. You need. You need to know it's <coughs> right because you need to know what your what your horse wants, and you need some relativity between day one and day two. And punters, David, need to have um, confidence in the integrity of the form book. Absolutely right. Now the retrospective idea is interesting, but certainly what I'm sure we. Surely we can all agree on, and that is that optics have no place in a going description. So optics that, is what you mean? What it looks like. So, yeah. for example, if at the start of a meeting you think it might be heavy ground, but you don't want to call it heavy because you feel that that that, that, that will detract from the, the the appeal of the meeting, well, you call it heavy ground because in your professional opinion, that's what it is. And I think, I mean, essentially, and this isn't meant to, um, uh, well, this inevitably does single out the Cheltenham Festival because that's what the uh, the Horse Race Betters Forum statement was about. I'll just read it very quickly. Following last week's Cheltenham Festival, in, ad in advance of the, the start of the turf flat season at Doncaster, the Horse Race Betters Forum is calling for British racing to up its game regarding correct reporting of the state of the going. The official going description at the start of, the ch of, of Cheltenham was given as soft, heavy in places, despite a pre-race going stick reading that was easily the lowest, brackets, softest at the course on record. That official description was altered to primarily heavy only after two races and uh, had been run in times that indicated exceptionally testing conditions and without rain having fallen in the interim. In effect, the clerk of the course uh, conceded he'd got the initial going description wrong. Right, and they conclude, I won't go through the rest of it, confidence in the accuracy of fundamental data is paramount in order that people continue to fund the sport through their betting and through their running as well. I, 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 to to so me, Joel, this is completely different. This would be bottomless to, to you <laughs> flat people. I've walked down the flat race tracks and I think, good gosh, I wouldn't walk my horse down there and you call it good to firm, you know. So it's completely different to what we call I didn't think... Because, you know, if I can get through... I can't get through many minutes without mentioning a horse called Cora Crambler, who's my president. So you wouldn't have heard of him. He's a very, very slow. Um, the, the great thing is you actually haven't heard of him. Which is great. With the beauty of this, this is but, not... This actually is true. So uh, I was worried about the ground, him running on heavy ground, and, I, and I, I walk onto the Cheltenham ground, and I thought, it's nothing compared to the heavy ground at Kelso or at, at Haydock. I think it, it, it's relative to the, yes, to, to, to the track that mm -hmm. you're on. Yeah. I, th I think we all agree 
that race courses, climates, etc., can can you know genuinely the clerk of the course job is a very very difficult one. From the press point of view, we can give them a right hammering, and they've got to pick up the phone when we ring them. Not like the training or jockeys fraternities where we've had a go at them and they say, "Well, I'm not talking to you after what you said last week." They have to. They're employed by the tracks to to give the state of the going. I think it's a very tricky job, but in terms of uh, we, we've got the going stick, which should give okay, the uniform. Okay, how do you? Uh, what do you see? How do we solve this then? I, we're discussing. I, I, I personally can't see how we solve it. We, well, we stick. If we the put stick a, to me is, is, is nonsense. But, the, but it's not nonsense, is it, Q? Because if you if the the stick is is the same stick and the track is the same track, so it's only relative to exactly, that track. But that's what you yeah. published for that track. So yeah. So a five point three at Cheltenham or whatever is yeah. a soft. A three point eight is a heavy. If if you if you say right at this course these numbers yeah. mean this ground, yes. then it's dead easy every time. Yeah, yeah. but it, it doesn't. But six point nine at Newbury. No, 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 yeah, exactly. Yeah, but yeah. that's why you have to have yeah. brackets. Yeah, thing. Whatever. Yeah. That, that, that's fine. Onwards, Doctor Newland. We've sold it. Doctor Newland <laughs> has um, thrown a match into the tinderbox. Uh, been the the scourge of many people in. Britain and Ireland this week with his comments, with quite controversial comments, outspoken comments, uh, in a, an article published on the Racing TV website entitled Jumps Racing in Britain is in Crisis. He says, I'm very concerned about the very existence of jumps racing in Britain, but it's his, um, his so, so, potential solutions that he's, he's proffered that have, have caused a real storm. He said... Um, for a while, we might have to reduce the number of races in the UK so that field sizes go up. If they make Irish-trained horses ineligible, the bigger UK owners would return to having their horses in training uh, by UK trainers, and the trend would start reversing. I'd have a blanket for all races. If we allow them to race in the UK once a year, maybe let that be at the Cheltenham Festival with perhaps one runner allowed per trainer in each race, not coming over every Saturday and winning everything. I mean, the pot has been well and truly stirred here. Yeah, it uh, has. We're going to hear from Dr Newland in a minute. We will. Uh, there, were, there were many contributions of which uh, I think this was probably the most controversial one. Um, in, in, some commentators responded to it by calling it uh, Trumpian or Faragian, if that's a, uh, an adjective, we will build a wall, etc. I, I think I'll just make this point, and that is in sport, and we all watch lots of sport, I'm sure, other than horse racing, and, th and that is um, that e exclusion and uh, isolationism is not generally something that, that promotes good competition. That if you, if you do... Uh, stop people from competing in your area. That isn't going to make your sport any good. In fact, it's going to make it a lot worse. I I'm reminded of. Do you remember King Kim Jong Il when he when he did that round of golf in 1994? And he was he was <laughs> again another another analogy. I didn't think. <laughs> he, he was his first round of golf. He was 52. And it, he was 38 under and hit 11 holes in one. But of course, none of the other world's golfers <laughs> were there, and so it, it, it was it was a, a golf tournament. <laughs> <laughs> that existed on its own, one person, and it was all the poorer for that. And I'm not sending Dr Richard Newland up. He's, he's a high achiever in two fields, and we don't, we're not in the, the process of inviting guests on and lampooning them. But I don't think that in terms of the exclusion, that that, that is going to promote, that that's going to make British racing stronger. And there are other issues that this article raised, and I'm going to come to Skew and David on this in a few moments' time because I want to hear from uh, Dr Richard Una, which we're going to do in just a moment. Watch live racing now on racingtv.com.